to share my screen with everyone here. Um, and we will jump right in. Um, my name again is Jonathan Shivers. I'm the Chief Business Development Officer here at Care Optimize, and we try to allow our, our clients to sit in on these uh, webinars that we do uh, usually every two weeks. Uh, this one is very appropriate because we are approaching um, the final 90-day um, reporting period for the first year of MIPS. So what we wanted to focus on today um, is the significance of the 90-day period. Why, why is this last 90 days such a, a big deal? Um, secondly, what are some things that you can do no matter how far down the track you are to make sure that the measures that you are selecting um, make the most sense for your group. Um, whether you've already selected measures to track or you haven't even given it a, a thought, that's okay. Uh, this would still be applicable to those in both camps. Uh, thirdly, talking about uh, the bonus point options that you still have in two categories. And finally, um, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the audit process and what you need to start doing today just in case you are audited. Okay, so as I said, uh, we currently are around here on the timeline. Um, we're, we're coming up on the last quarter of the performance year, um, and you're, even though the performance year is going to end on uh, the last day of December, the submissions are going to be due on March 31st. Um, those of you who fall into these categories on the left or you work with groups who, who clinicians fall into these categories, of course, you still must uh, submit something for 2017, um, and we've gotten a lot of questions on this. As long as your Medicare Part B allowable amounts are greater than $30,000 and you as a clinician are seeing more than 100 Medicare patients per year, and that is not 100 um, Medicare, um, uh, I, I should say that is specific to individual patients. So you have to be seeing at least 100 unique Medicare patients in order to qualify. Um, the number of 90,000 to bill and 200 patients, that does not kick in until next year. That was part of the proposed rule. Um, so please know for this year, it still is the 30,000 and the 100 line. Jonathan, I, the, Jonathan, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, we don't see the screen. I don't see your screen. Oh. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Let me, make sure I'm, let me see if I can share my screen. It was there, and now it's not. Oh, uh, you're right. I, I apologize, everyone. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it went. There you go. Can you see my screen now, Jan? Yes. Perfect. I apologize, everyone. Um, all right. So this is very relevant to to where we are today. Is you all should be aware of this chart here that CMS put out, um, and it gives everyone four options. Of course, you've all heard if you do nothing, you're going to get hit with your 4% penalty. Um, if you want to submit the minimum, that's fine. You can still do that. It's not too late. Uh, one quality measure, um, four out of the five um, base ACIs, or one improvement activity would help you meet your minimum. The third is uh, pertinent to our discussion today, and that is submitting a partial year's worth of data. Uh, in this case, it's a 90-day period that you need to submit. Uh, and so this will be what we spend the majority of our time discussing. Those um, who are able to submit a full year, either you started tracking at the beginning of this year, uh, or you have picked out measures that you know you can go back retroactively into your EHR and pull that data, assuming that you and your providers have been using those types of, of uh, discrete fields you can report on, technically is still an option for you, and that will be specific to your internal processes and your EHR. Okay, so the most important date is October 2nd. Um, that date marks the final chance you have to start tracking your measures for the consecutive 90-day period, that third option out of four that I just showed you. Um, that would give you to the end of the year to track for a full 90 days. Now, that doesn't mean that if you start on October 3rd, you will not receive a bonus and you're going to get penalized. I want to be very clear. What that means is if you select your measures by October 2nd, then you should be able 
to monitor them for a full 90 days, make sure they are tracking properly. If there's any changes that need to be made to your workflow, you can make those in time, but that you are going to, during a testation time, have to show consistent 90 days, or I should say consecutive 90 days. So that's why October 2nd is so important, is that is when you need to make sure you are starting to track or have the ability to track. The um, CMS, defines uh, the full participation, so very confusing, full participation is 90 days. I know that sounds very contradictory to what I just said where uh, for a full year, and let me see if I can go back one, here we go. Submitting for a full year means 365 days, the whole year, but fully participating in MIPS, you only need 90 days. That, that is a huge source of, of confusion we're finding. Um, half of your eligible patients for all of your payers. So even though this program is based, your eligibility is based on Medicare Part B, it still relates to the scoring of your patients seeing all of your payers. And of course, the last part is for three of the four categories. Um, the three categories, obviously quality, your ACI, which is just your meaningful use piece, both your base and your performance measures, and then the improvement activities, which are easiest of all. There's 92 uh, improvement activities, I believe, um, and those are, are by far the, the easiest to hit. Okay, so the four areas that we want to talk about today, uh, improving uh, your scores and making sure really that you've got the right measures is while you're selecting measures, these are the four pieces you need to keep in mind. Um, and if you hear nothing else that I say today, please jot this down um, or, or, you know, if you're going to follow up with us, make sure you ask us about this. The, these are, are the most important pieces. One is when you're selecting your measures, please don't just go on what measures look easiest on the CMS website. That is a terrible way to do this. You first want to go back and look at how you did with PQRS, most importantly PQRS, because the way that CMS derives the um, quality measures and the quality category are coming from PQRS. So if you did well in that program, uh, you're going to have a huge head start on picking your measures. So that is the most important thing you can do. Same thing with, with meaningful use as that aligns with the um, the ACI measures. The second piece that we're going to look at today is specialty measures. Um, thirdly, is keep in mind your specific patients and what your current workflow at your practice is when you are selecting measures. These measures, they vary greatly, uh, and some of them would require you to change significant workflows that you have in place. There are so many measures you can pick. Uh, we don't always advocate folks changing a workflow to meet a, spe a specific measure. Do it the other way around. Keep your workflow if you can and select a measure that matches your existing workflow. And finally, we're going to talk about benchmarks. So benchmarks and topping out measures, which is a huge buzzword right now. We're going to show you some examples of those and how that affects the scoring. So the first thing we want to talk about are the specialty measures. So there are currently 26 specialties that CMS has developed what they call specialty sets. So whether you're ophthalmology or cardiology or urology, they have measures that they feel like align best with those specialties. Um, if you're not aware of what those are, you can pull them up, you can call us and we'll send them to you, um, but that is always a great place to look at measures to say, hey, this aligns with what we did with our, um, um, with our uh, PQRS program. Um, now, this is extremely important from, from CMS, is that you will notice that some measures are not going to be applicable to your practice. And if in your practice's specific uh, specialty measure set, there are not six that are applicable to your practice, you 
only need to report the measures that are applicable and it would be less than six. Okay. Uh, now, when you go through the list of all these measures, there's two pieces of information you're going to want to make sure that you look at it and these are on the charts that are showing each measure step. The first is the submission type. Um, do you have to do it web-based? Does it need to be through claims or do you want to use a registry like, 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 like we are? Um, because not all of these measures are allowed to be submitted by certain types of submission, um, um, submission mechanisms. So keep that in mind. Secondly, is there are different quality measure types. You've got process efficiency and outcome. And as you'll see when we talk about bonuses, if you can get high outcome measures, um, you actually get bonus points for doing those. So if it comes down to it, always go with the higher outcome measures because you're going to get bonus points for selecting those. Okay, secondly, your patients. So make sure that the demographics that you have and the information that you have already matches what is required by your measures. Um, we've seen this with other practices that we work with. Again, they pick measures that look the easiest. It's just a bunch of demographic information. This sounds basic, but if you're not capturing that information today, it is going to be very difficult for you to do that, especially since we are approaching this 90-day window. Secondly, the billing data that you use. So look through the um, the diagnosis and the procedure codes that you're using because the ones you're using more frequently that there's a good chance those will align with certain measures. Whether they are specialty or they're the generic measures, there's hundreds and hundreds to choose from. Um, we go through, our clients that go through us all use certified registry. Um, so there's, you know, over 250 measures that they can select. Um, so make sure you keep your billing data in mind. The minimum for most cases that CMS has set is 20. So do not select measures if you know you're not going to have 20 eligible cases. There may be measures that look very easy for you and you might say, oh, perfect, we only have one or two patients that may fall in, into uh, this category or this measure. Uh, that, would, that would be a, a disastrous thing for you to do because you need to submit at least 20 cases for the vast majority of measures. And fourthly, just like anything else, uh, your eligible clinicians have to be on board with not just the MIPS program, um, but the measures that you select. Because you could have wonderful m measures picked out that look simple for you to hit. You all know if you know, you're working with an EHR, if you don't get them on board, it will be all for naught. Uh, and you need those physician champions pushing each other, whether you report as a group or as individual clinicians. Benchmarks. So there's two pieces I want to talk about benchmarks. One are the benchmarks themselves and give you an example of what that looks like. And secondly, topped out measures. So a benchmark, it's, it's just what CMS is using to decide how many points someone is going to get on their measures. Um, if you select a measure that does not have a benchmark, meaning CMS has not set the benchmark, the best you can score in that measure is a three out of 10. Obviously, I would advise elimin uh, uh, eliminating, you know, looking at using those measures that don't have benchmarks. Uh, you can only get three points. So if you're wanting a bonus, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, now, the way that CMS has made these benchmarks, and again, each measure has a different benchmark. One might be 50%, one might be 80%, one might be 20%, and one might be 99%, and I'll show you an example of that, is from the data from the 2015 submissions on the PQRS program. So CMS, um, since this is the first year of MIPS, they had to use uh, PQRS data to determine which measures are easiest for physicians to hit based on previous data and which ones are not. So the benchmarks are calculated by a decile system. Here's what that means. Let's say that in a measure, you calculate your numerator over denominator, and that gives you an 83% in that measure. That doesn't mean you got an 8.3 out of 10. Again, an 83% does not mean you get 8.3 points out of 10. What that means is you find which decile your 83% is located in for each 
individual measure. So I scored an 83% in my measure number one. So when I go to uh, that chart to see what decile it's in, it will tell me 83% scores X. And this is what it looks like. So this is just for one measure. Again, this will look different for every single measure. So in my case, in my measure, I scored an 83. So I can see I didn't quite make it to decile number six. I am just barely in decile number five. Since I'm in decile five, that means my points I've earned out of 10 is gonna be between five and 5.9. Since I'm in an 83, it's gonna be the lower end. So maybe a 5.1, 5.2, or 5.3 at the highest out of 10. Okay, so that is the value of understanding the benchmarks that CMS has assigned. You could do great, you could get in the 90s, but you would only be earning seven to 7.9 points. If you wanted to earn a 10 points in this, in this category, uh, excuse me, in this measure, I would have had to score a 100%. So be very careful when you are selecting your measures. Don't be rushed because it's the 90 days. Yes, the timeline is short now, but you have to make sure you're not picking uh, measures that are unreasonable for you to hit. The other half of this are topped out measures. So a topped out measure just means that groups have done so well on these in the past that CMS has made it really difficult for you to get 10 points. This is an actual example of one of them. So um, MDD, the major depressive disorder for adults. If I scored a 98% in this measure, so 98 out of 100, I would only receive three out of 10 points. Of course, in the first year, you can't be in the first or second decile. The minimum you can score is three points. If I score a 99.99, then I only receive four points, which means I have no way of hitting five, six, seven, eight, or nine points. The only way to get a full 10 points on this measure is having my numerator equal my denominator, which is very challenging. So please, when you see topped out measures, Make sure that you are absolutely certain that you can score well. Okay, let's talk about two ways you can be earning bonus points. So the first is through the advancing care information uh, category. Uh, again, this is the old MIPS where, uh, excuse me, the old meaningful use program. Um, the first is your, they call them registry bonuses, but all, all that means is you are submitting your information to a clinical data uh, registry or to a public health registry. And you can get one point uh, for each one that you do. Uh, the max here is gonna be five points in that category. Um, and the second is if you are using a certified EHR for certain improvement activities, then you can get up to 10 points. Now, uh, there are 18 of the 92 improvement activities that would count to get you these bonus points. Um, and the max you're gonna be able to get there is 10. So for your ACI category, you can earn 15 points just by selecting uh, those measures and reporting to a public health registry. The second way to earn bonus points is through your quality category. Um, and under the quality category, you have two ways as well. The first is just submit some extra measures. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you select uh, high priority measures, you're gonna get an extra bonus point for those. Uh, if you wanna use patient satisfaction or outcome measures, then you're gonna get two bonus points. And any combination of those, the most you can receive is six bonus points. Same with using a certified EHR. You can get six bonus points max, one for each one of those quality measures that you submit through your, through a, uh, by using a certified EHR to do so. Um, combining those gives you a max of 12 points for bonus. So by doing these, which are not difficult, you've got 12 points here and 15 points here. So a total of 27 bonus points. All right, the final piece we're gonna talk about today is auditing. And I know that is not the most um, exciting topic, um, this is going to be a lot of information I'm going to share with you, you know, over the next five minutes. Um, but this is very important because we do know that CMS has said that they will be auditing more um, than what we experienced during the Meaningful Use Program uh, because 
MIPS is a new program. Um, you know, they've tried to get a lot of information out about the audit process, but since none have occurred, unfortunately there isn't much. I'm going to give you what we recommend to our clients, some of the checklists that we use. Um, and of course, if you have any questions after the, the presentation, you are, um, you know, you are more than free to reach out to us and we're, we're happy to help you guys with this. Um, so, the, um, so CMS um, is requiring groups um, you know, to have six years worth of data. So they can go back and look at, um, you know, look at six years worth of, of your data uh, if they need to. The, the Fault claim, Claims Act, they encourage you to keep documentation for, I believe it's 10 years as well. Um, so under MIPS, CMS is going to conduct an annual validation process. So you could receive a request from CMS for an audit, and if you did, after they conducted this validation process for you, you would have 10 days um, to give them an initial response on that. Um, CMS, uh, they're going to verify that your um, ICD-10, that your um, procedure codes, that those combinations for that 90-day period, they've got to include at least half of the patients you reported on. That was one of the very first slides we talked about. 90-day period, at least half of the patients that you reported on. Now, the <laughs> most important piece of this slide is if that last bullet point. So if there were patients you should have reported on and you didn't, that is going to be a potential problem. So again, make sure you're reporting at least 50% of your patients. That is the most important takeaway from this slide. All right, so let's look at uh, the categories individually. So we're going to look at all three categories here. Um, the, um, uh, for the transition year, CMS is data validation process for the quality performance category. It's going to apply to both claims and registry submissions. It's going to validate whether you submitted all the applicable measures when you submitted fewer than six measures or if you didn't submit the required outcome measure, which you are required to do, or you didn't submit the other high priority measure, which you are required to do. Or finally, if you submit less than a full set of measures in a specialty set, which we discussed. So if you submit less than the full set because they're not applicable to your specialty, that's okay. But they are going to audit and see why you felt like your specialty set did not contain enough, and they will look through those measures to see if they do. So you want to make sure you're prepared to answer those types of questions. Okay, so let's go through this checklist. So um, what you will need um, in case of an audit for your, your quality category. The first uh, is you're going to want a copy of your submission report that it was successful. Um, and you're going to want to detail the specific quality measures, um, you know, your CQMs that you, that you submitted. You'll need documentation. Uh, the second point here, you're going to need documentation to support at least one of your outcome measures was reported. Um, if no outcome measures apply to your group, as in you looked and none of, no quality outcome measures apply to you, you have to submit a high priority measure. Again, if no outcome measures apply to you, you must submit a high priority measure. If you decide to report as a group, I'm sure some of you will, uh, then um, you need a, a, some type of policy or some type of proof that shows that the quality data that you submitted for all of your eligible clinicians in that tax ID, including any individuals that, that might be, you know, may be excluded from MIPS payment adjustments, like um, if they're in an APM track or they're new Medicare clinicians or they're low volume clinicians, you're going to need proof showing that, okay? So again, anyone excluded, you're going to need to show proof that they were excluded reasonably. You'll need evidence to support uh, compliance with the data completeness criteria uh, for each submission uh, mechanism that you use. Uh, you'll need evidence to report the validation efforts that you use just to show that, um, the, that you have accurate performance. If, you, if you're combining performance from multiple sources, 
Um, you'll need evidence of the, the data aggregation. You'll need evidence that the measure calculation was done properly and evidence of the reporting process. Um, let's see, you'll need to list any other high priority measures that you reported beyond your one required outcome measure. Uh, and that's for groups that are wanting to earn bonus points. So you need to list those out in your audit as well. Finally, uh, of course, you need to show proof that the um, in, in electronic reporting was satisfied um, because that's going to help you to earn bonus points. And if you are submitting them, you will need proof uh, that you did hit that criteria. Okay, so let's move to uh, improvement activities, the second of three categories. So for your improvement activities, the first thing, just like quality, and just like you'll see uh, on our next slide, is you have to have a copy of your successful submission report that's going to detail out each of those specific activities that you performed, in this case, which are improvement activities. Uh, you need to, um, to send in evidence uh, that supports the compliance with your activities, documentation showing participation in the CMS Improvement Activity Study. If you do not know what a CMS Improvement Activity Study is, that's okay. It would, it would not apply to you. Um, you're going to need to show proof that a certified EHR was used to carry out the activities. That's just like you saw in the quality category. Um, if any of you are in a, um, a rural or a health professional shortage area in HPSA, um, then you do get, you know, some, some leniency, but you have to show that because that affects your improvement activity category. So you would have to show proof of getting that, um, that designation. And then um, uh, finally, if, uh, if any of your clinicians are in uh, advanced alternative payment model, you need to keep those CMS scores for improvement activities in their APMs for this year to show that you didn't, there was no additional uh, reporting required for them for the MIPS program since they were covered under an advanced alternative payment model. Okay, final category. So we're looking at um, advancing care information and there's, and there's really two pieces to this because as you all recall, we have both your, your primary, um, uh, your base measures rather, and your uh, performance measures. So the first piece, just like the other two, is you want a copy of that submission report. Um, secondly, you want uh, performance reports for each measure that shows your numerator and your denominator. This should sound a lot like meaningful use to you off to a meaningful use audit. Uh, in fact, a lot of these you will recognize from meaningful use audits. Um, and reporting periods. Um, so you want the vendor's logo. Um, if you can't get the vendor's logo who you're using, you'll need to collect screenshots. Um, and how the reports were generated from each of those individual systems. You'll need to show uh, evidence to support compliance with the specific ACI measures, uh, and that's going to be where additional documentation is, is recommended or required in many cases. You'll want documentation from a vendor that explains the parameters used to calculate each percentage-based measure. Uh, if it's applicable to your group, you'll, um, you'll need self-developed or non-certified reports for measures. So if you have self-developed measures or non-certified measures that you're using, you'll need, to, um, you'll need documentation proving that these were acceptable to CMS. All right, and the final piece for advancing care information um, is you know, if, it's, if it's applicable to, to your practice, any internal policies um, that reference current state or local privacy laws that explain why patient portal and personal health record access rights was limited to certain populations that you serve. So an example of that might be if you're using proxies or you're seeing minors, that's probably the most common one we see is, is if, you're, if you're serving minors. Um, combining performance from multiple sources you need evidence of the processes used that we're adding the, the numerator and denominator together um, uh, so that you can show your final performance reported. So that would be like if you were using multiple EHRs um, or if you report across multiple eligible clinicians under one group is, a, is another good example of that. 
Um, finally here, if you're, you're reconciling performances from, from your different reports uh, and you need evidence of your processes that were used that determine the accurate numerator and denominator. Um, so an example would be the primary EHR is providing the denominator and some third party, um, say like a patient portal, provides the numerator information. So it's, again, two sources. You've got to show how those are being reconciled. Um, another one that, you know, is good to have is if, if having some document, documentation that it's going to explain um, extenuating circumstances that could impact your, especially your denominator values. So let's say um, a good example would be like an eligible clinician takes a, uh, an, a, leave, of a leave of absence, absent, uh, or those who have limited patient encounters during a, a year, something, something along those lines. Um, so, if you guys have joined any of our uh, previous webinars, this is something we've, we've talked about a lot, is uh, your scores for your physicians is going to be made public. Um, so it's, on, it's going to be on the Physician Compare website, um, and it's important, all these reasons in blue are important, but none most important in our opinion is when your patients see that information. Um, they will show the composite score of every provider on that website. Um, so, you know, as consumers start looking more and more online at reviews um, and, uh, you know, medical-related services, um, that's something that you need to be cognizant of. Um, all right, so last slide here. What, what are the next steps that you, that you take? Um, so, first is select your measures if you haven't already. And please select measures that allow you to earn a bonus. Bonus points will make a difference in what you are um, in, in what you are paid back on these reimbursements. Um, you need to start tracking your scores today. If you are not tracking your scores already, you need to do that or find a vendor or find somebody who can help you track your scores so that you understand how you are progressing throughout the month. Um, and finally, keep a running audit binder. This is something we do for our clients um, and something we did for our clients through Meaningful Use as well. Um, if you are audited, you will be very, very thankful that you have kept a running audit binder. If you are not audited, that's okay. Keeping a running audit binder is going to ensure that you have stayed on top of the scores, of how your scores are calculated, and catching anything that may, may fall through the cracks. Um, so, if anyone does have any, any follow-up questions, um, you know, you can always reach out to us. We are, we are more than happy to help you. This is my cell phone. You can reach me on this number at your convenience or shoot me an email. You can also go to our website. We have all our contact information there. Uh, we will be available. Um, I know it's a Friday afternoon, so you may not want to talk to us this evening, but uh, we will be available all next week as well um, as we approach that October 2nd deadline. Um, we are more than happy to help you all with any MIPS-related questions that you have. Um, you will all be receiving a, um, a link of this uh, presentation, so you can have it for your records. Uh, and you can also go to our website, and we'll have this posted on our website that you can view as well. So I'm going to leave this screen up just for a few moments if you want to jot down uh, my contact information. Um, and I will end this presentation now if you have any other questions, let us know, and everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.